bedtime is supposed to be a happy event for a tired child. For me, it was terrifying. While some children might complain about being put to bed before they finished watching their favorite film or playing their favorite video game, when I was a child, nighttime was something to truly fear. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it still is. As someone who is trained in the sciences, I cannot prove that what happened to me was objectively real, but I can swear what I experienced was genuine horror, a fear which in my life, I'm glad to say, has never been equaled. I will relate it to you as best I can. Make of it what you will, but I'll be glad just to get it off my chest. I can't remember exactly when it started, but my apprehension towards falling asleep seemed to correspond with being moved to my own room. I was eight years old at the time. Until then, I'd shared a room, quite happily, with my older brother. As is perfectly understandable for a boy of five years my senior, my brother eventually wished to get a room on his own. As a result, I was given a room in the back of the house. It was small, narrow, large enough for a bed and a couple chest drawers, but not much else. I couldn't really complain, because even at that age, I understood that we did not have a large house, and I had no real reason to be disappointed, as my family was both loving and caring. It was a happy childhood, during the day at least. A solitary window looked out onto our main garden. Nothing out of the ordinary, but even during the day, the light that crept in the room seemed almost hesitant. As my brother was given a new bed, I was given the bunk beds in which we used to share. While I was upset about sleeping on my own, I was excited at the thought of being able to sleep on the top bunk, which seemed far more adventurous to me. From the very first night, I remember a strange feeling of unease creeping slowly in the back of my mind. I lay on the top bunk, staring at my action figures and cars across the green and blue carpet. As imaginary battles and adventures took place between the toys on the floor, I couldn't help but feel my eyes being slowly drawn towards the bottom bunk as if something was moving in the corner of my eye. Something which did not wish to be seen. The bunk was empty, impeccably made with a dark blanket tucked in neatly, partially covering the two rather bland white pillows. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was a child, and the noise slipping under my door from my parents' television bathed me in a warm sense of safety and well-being. I fell asleep. <laughs> when you awaken from a deep sleep to something moving or stirring, it can take a few moments for you to understand what is truly happening. The fog of sleep hangs over your eyes and ears, even when lucid. Something was moving. There was no doubt about that. At first, I wasn't sure what it was. Everything was dark, almost pitch black. There was enough light creeping in from outside to outline the narrowly suffocating room. Two thoughts appeared in my mind almost simultaneously. The first was that my parents were in bed because the rest of the house lay in darkness and silence. The second thought turned to a noise, a noise which obviously woke in me. As the last cobwebs of sleep withered from my mind, the noise took a more familiar form. Sometimes, the simplest of sounds can be the most unnerving. A cold wind rustling through a tree outside, a neighbor's footsteps uncomfortably close, or, in this case, the simple sound of bedsheets rustling in the dark. That was it, the bedsheets rustling in the dark, as if some disturbed sleeper was attempting to get all too comfortable in the bottom bunk. I lay there, in disbelief, thinking that that noise was either my imagination, or perhaps my pet cat finding somewhere comfortable to spend the night. It was then that I noticed my door shut, as it had been when I fell asleep. Perhaps my mom had checked in on me, and the cat sneaked in my room then. Yes, that must be it. I turned to face the wall, closing my eyes, in the vain hope that I could just fall back to sleep. As I moved, the rustling noise from underneath me ceased. I thought that I must have disturbed my cat, but quickly I realized that the visitor in the bottom bunk was much less mundane than a pet trying to sleep, and much, much more sinister. As if alerted to 
and disgruntled by my presence. The disturbed sleeper began to toss and turn violently, like a child having a tantrum on their bed. I could hear the sheets twist and turn with increasing ferocity. Fear then gripped me. Not like a subtle sense of unease I had experienced earlier, but now, potent and terrifying. My heart raced as my eyes panicked, scanning the almost impenetrable darkness. I let out a cry, as most little boys do. I instinctively shouted for my mother. I could hear something stir on the other side of the house, but as I began to sigh, a sigh of relief, because I knew my parents were coming to save me, the bunk bed suddenly started to shake violently, as if I was gripped by an earthquake. Scraping against the wall, I could hear the sheets below me thrashing round as if tormented by malice. I did not want to jump down to safety, as I feared the thing at the bottom bunk would reach down and grab me, pulling me into the darkness. So I stayed there, with white knuckles, clenching my own blanket and a shroud of protection. The door finally and thankfully burst open, and I lay bathed in light, while the bottom bunk, the resting place of my unwanted visitor, lay empty and peaceful. I cried and my mother consoled me. Tears of fear followed by relief streamed down my face. Yet, though all the horror and relief, I did not tell her why I was so upset. I cannot explain it, but it was as if though whatever had been in that bottom bunk would return if I even as much as spoke of it, or uttered a single syllable of its existence. Whether that was the truth or not, I didn't want to know. But as a child, I felt as if the unseen menace remained close, listening. My mother lay in the empty bunk, promising to stay there until morning. Eventually my anxiety diminished, tiredness pushed me back towards sleep, but I remained restless, waking several times momentarily to the sound of rustling bedsheets. I remember the next day wanting to go anywhere, be anywhere but that narrow, suffocating room. It was Saturday and I played outside, quite happily with my friends. Although our house was not large, we were lucky to have a long, sloping garden in the back. We played there often, as much of it was overgrown and we could hide in the bushes, climb the huge sycamore tree, which towered above all else, and easily imagine ourselves in the throes of a grand adventure in some untamed exotic land. As fun as it all was, occasionally my eye would turn to the small window. Ordinary, slight, but for me, that thin boundary was looking a bit strange, a cold pocket of dread. Outside, the lush green surroundings of our garden, filled with the smiling faces of my friends, could not extinguish the creeping feeling crawling its way up my spine. Each hair standing on end, the feeling of something in that room, watching me play, waiting for the night when I would be alone, eagerly filled with hate. It may sound strange to you, but by the time my parents ushered me back into the room for the night, I said nothing. I didn't protest. I didn't even make an excuse as to why I couldn't sleep there. I simply, sullenly, walked into that room, climbed a few steps to the top bunk, and then waited. As an adult, I would be telling everyone about my experience. But even that age, I felt almost silly to be talking about something in which I really had no evidence for. It's funny how certain words can remain hidden from your mind, no matter how blatant or obvious they are. One word that came to my mind last night, lying in the darkness alone, frightened, aware of the rotten change in the atmosphere, a thickening in the air as if something had displaced it. As I heard the first casual twist of the bedsheets below, the first anxious increase of my heartbeat, at the realization that something was once again at the bottom of the bunk. A word in which had been sent into exile, filtered through my consciousness, breaking free of all repression, gasping and screaming, etching and carving itself into my mind. Ghost. As this thought came to me, I noticed that my unwelcome visitor had ceased moving. The bedsheets lay calm and dormant, but they had been replaced by something far more hideous. A slow, rhythmic, 
rasping breath heaved and escaped from the thing below. I could imagine its chest rising and falling, and each sorted, wheezing, and garbled breath. I shuddered and hoped beyond all hope that it would just leave. The house lay, as it did the previous night, in a thick blanket of darkness. Silence prevailed, all but for the perverted breath of my as yet unseen bunkmate. I lay there terrified. I just wanted this thing to go, to leave me alone. What did it want? Then, something unmistakably chilling transpired. It moved. It moved in a way it didn't before. Then, it threw itself around at the bottom bunk. It seemed unrestrained, without purpose, almost animalistic. This movement, however, was driven by awareness, with purpose, with a goal in mind. For that thing lying there in the darkness, that thing which seemed intent on terrorizing a young boy, calmly, nonchalantly sat up. Its labored breathing had become louder as now a mattress and a few flimsy wooden slats separated my body and an unearthly breath below. I lay there filled with tears, a fear which mere words cannot relate. I would not have believed that this fear could have been heightened, but I was so wrong. I imagined what this thing looked like, sitting there, listening from below by my mattress, hoping to catch the slightest hint. Imagination then turned to an unnerving reality. I began to touch the wooden slates which my mattress sat on. It seemed to caress them carefully, running what I imagined to be fingers across the surface of the wood. Then with great force, it prodded angrily between two slates, into my mattress. Even though there was padding, it felt as though someone was viciously sticking their fingers into my side. I let out an almighty cry, and the wheezing shaking, and moving thing in the bunk below replied by kindly and violently vibrating the bunk as it done the night before. Small flakes of paint powdered into my blanket from the wall. Once again, I was bathed in light. There stood my mother, loving and caring as she always was, with a comforting hug and calming words which eventually subdued my hysteria. Of course she asked me what was wrong, but I could not say. I dared not say. I simply said to no one over and over again. Nightmare. The pattern continued for weeks, if not months. Night after night, I would awaken to the sound of rustling sheets. Each time I would scream, so as to not provide the abomination with the prod to feel me. With each cry in bed, I would shake violently, stopping for the arrival of my mother, who would spend the rest of the night in the bottom bunk, seemingly unaware of the sinister force torturing her son nightly. Along the way, I managed to feign an illness a few times, to come up with a less than truthful reason to sleep in my parents' bed. But more often than not, I would be alone for the first few hours of each night. The room where the light would come outside did not sit right alone with that thing. With time, you can become desensitized to almost anything, no matter how horrific. It had come to realize that, for whatever reason, the thing could not harm me when my mother was present. I am sure the same would be for my father, but as loving as he was, waking him from sleep was almost impossible. After a few months, I had grown accustomed to a nightly visitor. Do not mistake this for some unheartly friendship. I detested the thing. I still feared it greatly, as I could almost sense its desires. One filled with a perverted and twisted hatred and longing for me. My greatest fears were realized in the winter. The days grew short, longer nights merely provided this wretch of more opportunities. It was a difficult time for my family. My grandmother, a wonderfully gentle woman, had deteriorated greatly since the death of my grandfather. My mother was trying her best to keep her in the community as long as possible. However, dementia is a cruel degenerative illness robbing a person of their memories one day at a time. 
Soon she recognized none of us, and it became clear she needed to be moved to a nursing home. Before she moved, my grandmother had a particularly difficult few nights, and my mother decided that she could stay with her. As much as I love my grandmother and felt nothing but anguish for her illness, to this day I feel guilty that my first thoughts were not her, but that nightly visitor that may do things in my mother's absence. Her presence being the one thing I was sure was protecting me from the full horror of this thing's reach. I rushed home from school that day and immediately wrenched the bed sheets and mattress. I rushed home from school that day and immediately wrenched the bed sheets and mattress from the lower bunk, removing all the slates and placing an old desk of chest drawers and some chairs, which kept the cupboard where the bottom bunk used to be. Um, I told my father I was making an office, which he found adorable. But I'd be damned if I'd give that thing a place to sleep for one more night. As darkness approached, I lay there knowing my mother was not in the house. I did not know what to do. My only impulse was to sneak into her jewelry box and get a small crucifix, which I had seen there before. While my family were not religious, at that age I still believed in God and hoped that somehow he'd protect me. Although fearful and anxious, while gripping the crucifix under my pillow tightly in one hand, sleep eventually came, and as I drifted off into a dream, I hoped that I would awaken this morning without an incident. Unfortunately, this night was the most terrifying of all. I woke gradually. The room was once again dark. As my eyes adjusted, I could gradually make out the window, and the door, and the walls, and some toys on a shelf. Even to this day, I shudder when I think of it. For there was no noise, no rustling of the sheets, no movement at all. The room felt lifeless. Lifeless, yet not empty. The night of the visitor, that unwelcome wheezing, hate-filled thing that terrorized me at night after night, was not at the bottom bunk. It was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaken every sound of my voice. I lay motionless. I couldn't scream. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to let it know I was awake. I had not yet seen it. I could only feel it. It was obscured under my blanket. I could see its outline. I could feel its presence. But I dared not look. The weight of it pressed down on top of me, a sensation I will never forget. When I say that hours passed, I do not exaggerate. Laying there motionless in the darkness, I was every bit scared and frightened. If it had been during the summer months, it would not have been light by then. But the grasp of winter is long and unrelenting. And I knew it would be hours before sunrise, a sunrise which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature, but I reached a breaking point, a moment where I couldn't wait anymore, where I could survive under this intimidately deviant abomination no longer. Fear can sometimes wear you out, make you threadbare, a shell of nerves leaving you only the slightest trace behind. I had to get it out of my bed, then I remembered the crucifix. My hand still lay underneath the pillow, but it was empty. I slowly moved my wrist around to find it, menacing as best as I, as I could. But it could not be found. I either knocked it off of the top bunk, or it had. I could not even think of it. Been taken from my hand? Without the crucifix, I lost any sense of hope. Even at such a young age, you can be acutely aware of what death is, and intensely frightened of it. I knew I was going to die in bed if I lay there dormant, passive, doing nothing. I had to leave the room behind, but how? Should I leap from the bed and hope that I make it to the door? What if it is faster than me? Maybe I should slip out of the top bunk, hoping not to disturb my uncanny bedfellow. Realizing that it had not stirred when I moved, trying to find the crucifix, I began to have the strangest thoughts. 
What if it was asleep? It hadn't so much as breathed since I'd woken up. Perhaps it was wrestling it, believing that it finally got me, that I was finally in its grasp, or perhaps it was toying with me. After all, it had been doing it just countless nights, and now, with me under it, pinned against the mattress, with no mother to protect me, maybe it was holding off, savoring its victory until the last possible moment, like a wild animal savoring its prey. I tried to breathe as shallowly as possible, and mustering every ounce of courage I could. I reach over slowly, with my right hand, and begin to peel the blanket off me. What I found under those covers almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but as my hand moved the blanket, it brushed against something, something smooth and cold. Something which felt unmistakably like a gaunt hand. I held my breath in terror. I was sure it must now know that I was awake. It did not stir. It felt dead. After a few moments, I placed my hand carefully further down the blanket and felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confidence and almost twisted sense of curiosity grew as I moved my hand down further to a disproportionately longer bicep muscle. The arm was outstretched lying across my chest the rustling hand on my left shoulder, as if it had grabbed me in my sleep. I realized that I would have to move this cadaverous appendage if I even so much as hoped to escape its grasp. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing on my shoulder of nighttime invaders stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled in my stomach, in my chest, as I recoiled my hand in disgust. It was subtle, but its grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No tears came, but God, how I wanted to cry. As its hand and arm slowly coiled around me, my right leg brushed against the long, cool wall my bed lays against. Of all that happened to me in that room, this was the strangest. I realized that this clutching, rancid thing, which drew great delight from violating the young boy's bed, was not entirely on top of me. It was sticking out from the wall like a spider striking from its lair. Suddenly, its grip moved from a slow tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed my clothes as if frightened that the opportunity would soon pass. I fought against it, but its emaciated arm was too strong for me. Its head rose up, breathing and contouring under the blanket. I now realized where it was taking me. Into the wall. I fought for dear life. I cried, and suddenly my voice returned to me, yelling and screaming, but no one came. And then I realized why it was so eager to suddenly strike. Why this thing had to have me now. Though my window, that window which seemed to represent so much malice from outside, streaked hope. The first rays of sunshine. I struggled further knowing that if I could just hold on, it would soon be gone. As I fought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted, slowly pulling itself up to my chest, its head now poking me from under the blanket, wheezing and coughing and rasping. I do not remember its features, I simply remember the breath against my face, foul and as cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon, that dark place, that suffocating room of concept was washed, bathed in sunlight. I passed out as its scrawny fingers encircled my neck, squeezing the very life from me. I awoke to my father offering me some breakfast. A wonderful sight indeed. I'd survived the most horrible experience of my life until then, and now I moved the bed away from the wall, leaving behind the furniture that had believed would stop the thing. Weeks passed without an incident, yet on one cold, frostbitten night, I'd awoken to the sound of furniture where the bunk beds used to be vibrating violently. I lay there. Sure, I could hear a distant wheezing coming from deep within the wall, finally fading into the distance, but it wasn't a real threat. I've never told anyone this story before, 
To this day, I still break out in a cold sweat. Call this superstition if you will, but as I said, I cannot discount conventional explanations with such deep paralysis, hallucination, or an overactive imagination. But I can say this. The following year, I was given a larger room on the other side of the house. And my parents took the strangely suffocating and elongated place to their bedroom. They said they didn't need a large room. Just one big enough bed for a few things. It lasted ten days. We moved on the 11th. 